Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to the September 2021 Zoom Sitter Seminar. First, I would like to thank Jean McAvoy and Julie Carson from the Immokalee IFA Center for their help and cooperation. Today's program offers one CEU for pesticide license renewal and one CEU for certified crop advisors. So if you need to get CEUs, go to the chat box and get the information. You will need to send an email to Jean McAvoy. Provide your name, your license number, and your email address. Our guest speaker this morning is Dr. Arnold Schumann. He is a professor at the University of Florida IFES Citrus Research and Education Center in Lake Alfred. The title of his presentation is Growing Citrus for the Fresh Market in Citrus and the Protected Screen, which is CAPS. The presentation will include an update on six years of grapefruit yields in CAPS, current promising varieties for CAPS, CAPS screen requirements for Asian citrus salad exclusion, and preliminary results from experiments to improve color break and internal fruit quality in cups. It's all yours, Dr. Schumann. Thanks very much, Ongi. Thanks for inviting me, everyone, and um, welcome. <clears throat> so I'll start with sharing the screen here. Everything yes. good? Can you hear me and can you see it? Yes. Okay, great. All right, so that's just my title slide. Let me get my laser pointer on here so we can point to things. Okay. So, uh, Mongi already <clears throat> told you the content. I'll introduce a bit of uh, what CAPS is, um, look at screen requirements, uh, do the grapefruit yields. We are now in our seventh year, so we have six years prior to that, uh, but the CAPS is now growing in its seventh year. We'll look at some of the uh, uh, evolving promising varieties uh, that we think are doing best and improving uh, uh, some experimentation to improve quality of the fruit, especially the external color and internal uh, total soluble solids. Uh, so what this is all about, of course, is the, uh, the HLB disease, which is endemic in Florida. And in order to be a fully functional endemic, it consists of this disease pyramid. It's the psyllid at the top, uh, which is the vector. Um, it has the Liberibacter asiaticus pathogen. Uh, it needs a citrus host. And there's also an environmental impact here. An environment influences all of those. That's why it's really a three-dimensional pyramid. And fortunately, by manipulating this environment, we can change things. We can actually break the cycle of endemic disease. And that's what we're doing with the cups. We're excluding this Asian citrus psyllid, and therefore we exclude HLB. So this is our facility at CREC, built and uh, completed in June of 2014. It's just 1.3 acres, quite, quite small, but it served as a good prototype over, as I said, now seven years. Um, one acre of it is plantable. So the remaining 0.3 acres was re is required for vehicle traffic and so on. And um, here's this January 2014 to October 2015 uh, time-lapse photography to show you the construction and planting and, and the first year of growth. But this was, uh, a lot of you would not have seen this before, so some of you will, but uh, I thought I'd show it again. So this was constructed and um, completed in, in June, like I said. So this planting occurred in the, in the, in the late summer then this is growth. You can see the shadows there. You see the shadows on the where I'm pointing. That means it's midwinter. Now it's going into spring. The shadows are receding again. Uh, this is pointing kind of northeast. And as expected in the spring, tremendous growth occurring. And somewhere about now, you'll see thunderstorms occurring and showing up in the snapshots. And that means it's summer. 
So very good growth in the first year. And these were all grown in pots initially. Um, and we use three different sizes of pots for those of you that, that don't know, um, uh, roughly in gallons, five gallons, seven and a half gallons and 10 gallon pot sizes were compared and different types of pots also. So let's go back to the screen now. That's the of paramount importance uh, is to exclude the psyllids, of course. It also needs to be suitable for growing trees. So um, what we, it's very commonly used is uh, high density polyethylene material, which is woven. And, and I'll go into some other details later on in a future slide, but what we defaulted to is what all the nurseries use. Most people in the world use these for excluding small insects. So it's, it's HDPE, which is high, death, high density polyethylene. And it allows 80% of visible light and photosynthetically active light to transmit through the screen. But it excludes about as, as much as 60% of the ultraviolet. So only lets 40% UV through. And here's some to scale example. Um, so everything's to scale. The size of that psyllid relative to the screen is accurate. Here's 40 mesh and on the right is 50 mesh. Also what I've done is I've drawn the actual thorax shape, cross-sectional shape of a psyllid to scale. So you can see it cannot en enter a 50 mesh and nor can it enter a 40 mesh screen. Uh, on, on, on those bar stools. I don't want to watch it. I just want to know if you get tired of holding it. What happened? Okay, so we have uh, with smaller oh. holes, we have less ventilation, better ventilation with larger holes, which is the 40 mesh. Remember that the mesh system is uh, the number of holes per inch. So that's the convention used here in the US uh, and elsewhere, some other places, but it, it doesn't refer to the actual dimensions of the hole. It, it refers to the number of holes per inch. So that's why the larger the number, the finer the meshes, the smaller the holes are. So to give you perspective, the holes on a 40 mesh are 0.79 by 0.4 millimeters in, di in uh, dimensions, uh, length and width. And uh, for the 50 mesh, as expected, one dimension changes. So the, the width changes, but not the length. And you can see that it's just a different size rectangle. And that's very common. Um, that most of these are rectangular type mesh. To give, it, to give you the numbers for the psyllid, psyllid thorax height is 0 0.77 and, and plus minus some deviations. So these are averages of many measurements. And, um, and then the width is a little narrower. So that's why I drew not a circle there in the cross section, but it's actually an oval shape. So it's a little narrower on the uh, horizontal dimension if it's, if it's a psyllid standing upright. So the, a detailed study was conducted with actual psyllids um, looking at... Uh, Who's with us today and get four, I mean, or get two extras. Can you please mute yourself when you, when you are attending the seminar? Otherwise your voice travels through to everybody. Thank you. Okay, so this, there was a publication, as I'm pointing to here, in a journal, um, looking at uh, details experiments and looking at uh, finding the proper mesh size. So looking at the, the lighting environment in a little more detail here, um, I mentioned it before, um, it also impacts other aspects of the growing environment, uh, namely the higher daytime temperature and the lower wind speed. Um, and at night, actually, the temperatures are generally lower in, this, in the cups than, than on the outside. Um, as I mentioned, 80% transmission of light, visible light, 40% UV. Um, these conditions allow small pests and airborne diseases to pass through the screen, such as mites, thrips, species spot fungus. So all the spores tend to get through, uh, and also some weed seeds, I suspect. Um, larger predators of some pests, which could be beneficial, unfortunately, unfortunately are excluded. They cannot pass through the screen. But, but notice here, this is a, an interesting aspect here. You get very good light, penet uh, light distribution through the tree canopies. Because if you look upwards at the screen, you'll notice there's not just a single spot of light in the sky like you would outdoors. Instead, it, through refraction and diffraction, it, it's, uh, it spreads throughout that, that so-called artificial sky, I guess you could call it, which is the roof of the cups. And that means the light is then entering the tree canopy from many, many angles, many more than usual. And it allows for very good uh, lighting inside the canopy. Less stark shadows. Okay, here's, here's a little bit of that paper that I mentioned, the, the journal paper, looking at screens in detail. Uh, we, we tested a number of screens. We examined them under the microscope as shown here. 
all the way from 17 mesh, 25 mesh, 30 mesh, 40 mesh, and then finally on the right is 50 mesh. And again, the cross-sectional uh, uh, height and width of psyllid thoraxes um, are shown here to scale. And you can see very, just at a, at a glance that all these larger sizes, which are the smaller mesh numbers, 17, 25, and 30 are unsuitable, psyllid could get through. And it's really only the 40 and 50 mesh that were tested that are suitable for excluding the psyllid. But as I said, this, the experiment also included some live assays with, with psyllids and food on, an other, on, the, on the far side of, a, of different screens. And we actually measured the ability to, for the psyllids to actually walk through or crawl through. Um, this was not just done through microscopic examination like this. It was actually done with live psyllids. You can see the detail in the paper. Um, we also looked at some uh, knitted screens because they are available. So these are a little bit confusing. They, they, one brand is Knitex Code 40 and another one is Code 50. Don't be confused by those numbers. They have, we found out they have no relation at all to, to mesh. They are not mesh sizes. They are just, I think they, they re relate to the shading index of those uh, knitted screens. In other words, the ability to cast shade. Uh, furthermore, because of the knitting uh, construction, so on, where I'm pointing there is the low magnification. Here on the right is high magnification. And again, there's the size of the psyllid cross sections. You can see because they're knitted, there's much larger holes and then much smaller holes and psyllids can just crawl through the larger holes. So, so they're not suitable. Uh, don't, don't be uh, caught in the uh, situation where you're using or buying a knitted screen because it will not work. So we suggest the use of woven screens with openings of 385 micrometers or less, which is equivalent to 40 mesh or greater, because these exclude the Asian citrus psyllid. More information can be found in the full research article, and also there's an EDIS article that you can search for. All right, so, so just a few other introductory aspects of our caps. We use seven tanks of fertilizers, uh, urea, calcium nitrate, potassium nitrate. Sometimes we use potassium chloride, uh, towards the fall, where we want to reduce nitrogen. I'll, I'll mention more about that later. We change that to potassium chloride later on. But most of the year, it's potassium nitrate, magnesium sulfate, and a blend of micronutrients. In addition, we have phosphoric acid for phosphorus source and sulfuric acid if we need to adjust uh, the pH of the final mixture. The final mixture, uh, well, the peristaltic pumps, as shown here, pump these individual components according to a computer program to a mixing tank. 200 gallon mixing tank where water is added simultaneously and mixed. Uh, so it's a dilute mixture that goes out about 1.5 to 2 millisiemens per centimeter conductivity. Um, and then it's computer controlled and pumped out to the zones. And we use this. This is a real neat sensor. It's a non contact conductivity sensor, uh, it's a toroidal type of sensor which works for years without any maintenance. We use that for measuring the final conductivity so that everything's good. Uh, for Measuring and, and uh, estimating the environment in the cups, we use standard um, uh, Davis weather stations. Uh, here's an example that uh, one of our grower cooperators at KLM Farms is using. Um, we set up for him also to, to use uh, a Davis weather station, and it's got a web interface which shows you everything, including soil moisture, where I'm pointing here. And we use the same moisture sensors in our cups, even though we have uh, predominantly pot still. Um, we can use them in the soil or pots, doesn't matter. If in pots, we put one on the top and one on the bottom like that. We use these Acclima TDR volumetric uh, moisture sensors. Most of our spraying for the seven years was done with this ultra low volume sprayer, although recently we've also started using more of an um, air blast sprayer. The ultra low volume sprayer puts out 27 gallons per acre. The uh, standard air blast sprayer on a narrow track that puts out 100 gallons uh, at two miles per hour. And if we want a higher, if we want to double the rate, of course, we drive at half the speed. So we just drive at one mile per hour, which we have done on occasion. Uh, hedging is done with the sickle bar hedger. This is showing grapefruits being hedged. And this is the cups at, um, I can't read the title there because uh, it's being obscured, but I believe this is at about two months. It's being obscured by the Zoom menus which I could move, but don't worry about that. Okay, and this is, uh, this is six years later. So just showing you a few snapshots as those of you that have not been to visit. Um, this was just taken last year. And 
this is a closer up view of the pots at six years, honey mocot. These are at a very high density, eight feet by four feet, and making 1,361 trees per acre. Uh, another view uh, at six years, had a very good yield again last year. So this was, this was the, the most recent yield on the trees. And you can see the size of the trunk of the tree growing in the pot. It gets quite large. And actually with some varieties with grapefruit, that becomes, after about five years, it becomes very problematic. And in fact, we had to transplant almost all our grapefruits into the ground in 2020. And I'll show you some, some pictures of that. Um, but these honey mercots seem to keep going at year seven now, and they're still going well. They've got a good crop of fruit on them. Um, but eventually, understandably, everything will run out of space. Uh, it, uh, these are good pots because they have these, these fluted ribbed uh, surrounds. They also have holes which allow air pruning of the roots. So they have all the features that make them good for long-term root growth in a, in a pot. But you know, eventually, it's, it's just a mass of roots and, and wood inside there. Uh, there's really nowhere to put the water or the nutrients. And I think every single variety that we have will, will eventually need to be moved to, to the ground. This was an earlier view, um, I think probably at two and a half years. So, so fruiting production started really early because the tree growth is so fast, about twice as fast as it is outdoors, especially because it doesn't have HLB. Uh, so we got our first commercial crop at two years um, and every year thereafter. Very early, here's some, some more views of uh, honey mercot. The first one was also honey mercot in production. Um, and uh, this is uh, honey mercot on the tree and in a shipping box ready to go. And let's look at Ray Ruby then, because um, I wanted to focus on all six years that we have for that in, in a little more detail than the other varieties. Um, so this was, uh, let me get rid of this menu. Just bear with me one second here. Uh, because I cannot see what I'm looking at here. Where do I move it? Disable hard video panel. I guess that's it. No, that's not it. Hard floating mating controls. Yep. Okay, good. So that was 871 trees per acre density and um, the yield in that year, which was at two and a half years age, was 346 boxes per acre at that density. These are, and these are 10 gallon pots. So that title already tells you everything you need to know about it. Um, over two years, the sum total, they already had a yield in the first year. So cumulative over two years was 496 boxes per acre. And, um, and this is Ray Ruby on US 897, as you can see. Now, it's not changing slides, so. Sorry about that, let me. Let me first make sure you all can still see and hear me. And Mongi, can you just respond? Nothing? Anybody? Dr. Schumann, I can hear you. Thank yes. You. Thank you. Yeah, I'm just I'm concerned because my, my, my screen wasn't responding when I tried to change slides. So I'm just making sure nothing freezes up. Okay, I'll try to continue like this. I'm, I'm just having problems seeing, reading the title. So just excuse me for that. As, when I take the menu away, which is obscuring it, then everything freezes up. So I won't do that again. Okay, here we go. All right, so this is just a, a photo of the finished product. At, uh, again, I can't read the title, but it's early years, maybe four and a half years. Um, this is, uh, has been through the packing house and ready to ship. And uh, these, these were pretty much grade A fruit uh, in, the, in, a, in a large part, not all of them, but I can tell you the pack out was hundreds of percent better than anything from outside, which at the time we had an outside block of grapefruit also, um, right from inception in 2014, which we used as a control, it set up exactly the same way with pots, same feeding, same nutrition, everything. Those trees did okay for two years and then they just collapsed from greening. They all became infected and the quality of the fruit became horrendous, uh, you know, much less than 50% pack out. Whereas these maintained a good pack out close to 100%. Um, so it shows you the quality a little bit just uh, visually. 
here are the numbers that are all important. Um, this is five years of, of results. I'm not showing you the sixth year on this graph because between year five and six, we moved the trees from pots to the ground. As I mentioned, we transplanted them. So it's not really not fair to, to, to put, uh, well, we, we, didn't, we weren't able to measure these categories. So if you look at these bars here, first one is 20 liter pot, the next one is a 25 liter pot, the next one is a 35 liter, and the last one is also 35 liter. Uh, equating roughly to five gallons, seven and, seven and a half gallons, and then the uh, 10 gallon pot here, roughly. Um, and of course, because they were all moved to the ground, that treatment doesn't exist anymore. So we, we cannot really stack year six results on top of these. It, it wouldn't be a fair comparison. So I'll, I'll mention it in the next slide, year six. But year, years one to five, you can see year one was a low yield, but it was already there, over 100 boxes for each category. And there's two rootstocks being shown here, US 897 there for those three bars. And then the last bar is sour orange, which was a, actually a very good rootstock in a cups. Uh, fruit size is generally better and so is internal quality. Um, and uh, so far we have not had Tristaza uh, disease, uh, citrus Tristaza infecting those trees because the aphid that carries the disease cannot enter the cups. So, so far so good. It doesn't look like it can enter. We've never noticed it, never seen it. Um, all right, so, so, so uh, as you expect, every year the yield went up very nicely, really reaching full production by year three. Uh, then year four, the green, and year uh, uh, five is the pink. And uh, notice the cumulative totals, really nice, nearly 3,000 boxes per acre for the medium-sized pot. And, and sour orange, Maybe a little slow in starting, but very close to that also with a very high yield in, in year five, 908 boxes per acre. Um, so that I think in a snapshot summarizes the production, uh, except for year six, which I will catch up on here. So in year six, all the Ray Ruby on US 897 and also the sour orange were removed from the pot because they were struggling. And you can see here, this is a, a, the, the root system taken out of a pot and it, it's just wood inside there. So, Without further ado, we simply just removed the pots, left the irrigation system in place, which there it is, with four, four dripper emitters, and uh, just dug a hole in the ground, stuck it in, reconnected the irrigation, and off they go. That's all it took. We didn't have to do any special loosening of the root ball or anything. Uh, it was actually amazing. They didn't need that, none, none at all, and you'll see the result. We did that last year, February of 2020, and then despite that, very invasive procedure, they continued to flower and set fruit in March, just a month later. Amazing. I mean, they didn't stop. So therefore, yields in 2021 were, were picked. They were good yields, but they were, they were much less than before. So they dropped down to 418 and 663 boxes, which is not shabby uh, for Ray Ruby and, uh, sorry, for 897 and Sour Orange rootstocks, respectively. Uh, and recovery was complete and normal production resumed. And you can see that this was taken just on Monday, just this week. These are the same trees uh, in the ground now. And fruit size has improved again. That's the other thing we noticed that that's what really forced us to re release them from the pots is that fruit size was getting smaller and smaller. And for grapefruit, that's paramount. You've got to have great large fruit size for grapefruit. It, it just doesn't get into a good selling uh, grade if you, if you don't have good fruit size, obviously. Here you can see the trunks of the trees now on the ground. That's just a support fold, fold for the cups. You can see there on the end, oh, sorry, for the trellis. That's a trellis pole. But here's the other trunk where I'm pointing at here. Um, so they're looking very happy. Here's another close up showing internal fruit in that canopy. And, and, and just um, Related to this, I didn't mention one more rootstock, which is X639. That's shown here. And um, granted, it's, it's being planted at a high density, but it's still in the pots, even now at year seven. You can see the pots down there. This was 2019-20 yield. Uh, so that was the uh, was two yields back. And I'll show you the graph of all the yields, of all, all six years of them. So this variety, at least this rootstock, also Ray Ruby variety is still in pots because it's still performing. We don't really know what's going on. They're in 10 gallon pots. The only difference is they had higher density. So that might be the key, I think, because when you think about it at less, at a higher density, the canopy cannot grow as big as at a lower density. 
So there's probably a better route to shoot balance. That, that's my uh, intuitive interpretation of that. Uh, so therefore, uh, a pot system can sustain smaller canopies for longer than large canopies because the ratio, balance of ratio of root to shoot is better. So, so that's probably what it is. But I, I mean, realistically, I expect it to run out of steam probably as early as next year. But right now, there's no indication of it. So incredible yield here. I think I don't, can't read the number, but it's about 1,400 boxes per acre. And you'll see the numbers here. So this is Ray Ruby on X639, all in pots, 10 gallons for six years. Uh, starting off at about over 100 the first year, over 200 the second year, then shot up to full production in year three, just like the other rootstocks, over 1,000, a uh, little bit of alternate bearing here, under 1,000 the fourth year, uh, fifth year was, was the highest, which, I, which you saw the photo of, that's this one, that's what it looked like, and then uh, the most recent year was last year, down a little bit again maybe that's just alternate bearing i hope it is they look pretty good right now so so i don't know if they've run out of space in the pots yet which is which is amazing so that's the exception x639 but like i said think about it we also have different density there but it shows you what can be done oh of note is the total yield which i believe was uh, again i can't read the number but i believe it's four thousand something and something boxes per acre over a period of six years. If you look at that realistically with endemic HLB, uh, grapefruit would be producing at best maybe 200 boxes per acre, of, of the, especially if you consider pack out, which is low. If you consider just the marketable fruit coming out of endemic HLB, outdoor grapefruit, first of all, it takes about five years to get started. Uh, and then it maintains at best about 200 boxes per acre. Uh, if you figure out how many years it would take for that situation to get to 4,000 and something boxes per acre, it would take 25 years easily. So what we've done here is we've grown 25 years of outdoor uh, HLB positive fruit in just six years. That, that puts it kind of in perspective using cups. Um, just a few photos of interesting fruit that we've grown there over the years. Persian lime is really good. Uh, lemons do really well too, just to show you a bit of diversity. Ray Ruby grapefruit. I won't show all of them in the interest of time. Uh, that's the inside of the rare ruby that we've been looking at. And so really, again, to emphasize this, the grapefruits are the top varieties there. And we've also got uh, ruby red, which is related to rare ruby. It's really close. And then we have flame also. We have flame grapefruit. It's excellent also. With, it appears to be slightly earlier maturing too, the flame. And, and the internal quality is excellent. It's got a brighter red color. But this again is rare ruby. Another Ray Ruby close up. And then other varieties. Here's Dancy, um, taken, a, I think, two seasons ago. Still doing well. The trees are loaded with fruit this year. Um, I'll show you a few more attributes of those in a table coming up. Uh, his Sugar Bell also does very well, uh, although very heavily alternate bearing, whereas, whereas the Dancy doesn't seem to be. So, um, I think fruit set is a bit problematic with sugar bell, at least in cups. So, um, but when it when it produces, it produces very good quality fruit. Um, good color break if we if we treat it right. And we've discovered what to do now. Uh, at the end of this talk, I'll show you uh, what we've found the best manipulation of parameters is to get the best fruit uh, color break and quality. W Mercot is really an excellent soft citrus in, in cups. Um, it's uh, seedless, number one very important. Um, uh, the quality ratio, all the internal quality parameters are excellent also. Uh, color break has been problematic, but I think we've solved it. So as you can see here, there's nothing wrong with this color break. Um, so, and it's, it's, it's not terribly alternate bearing. Now, honey mercot, on the other hand, can be fairly alternate bearing. Um, here's another one, which I don't think has been released yet. Uh, Fred might want to comment on this. That's the uh, UF711. I can read the title there. Um, a very tasty fruit. Uh, just about everybody that's ever sampled some here has said this exceptional fruit. It's, it's seedy though. It is seedy. Colors up beautifully, beautiful color break. Very clean looking fruit. Um, doesn't get much blemishes. And it's kind of, um, kind of honey, honey mocot sized, maybe a little smaller. Here's honey mocot again. Um, this was just taken about a year ago. Uh, very prolific. Uh, it's seedy in the cups. 
Um, and we've, I think, again, we had some quality problems with color break and internal uh, soluble solids, but I think we've solved that. So we're getting earlier maturity now with the right manipulation. Here's just a box of them. Um, this is the early pride. Um, we, we, we keep thinking one year that it's great potential and uh, should be a really good cups variety. And then the next year it disappoints us. So in a nutshell, the things that disappoint us is uh, alternate bearing uh, so, and, and fruit set problems, certainly in some years. So it might be an alternate bearing function. But the, we also get um, some quite a lot of splitting, which then causes fruit drop as early as summer. So we can lose a lot of fruit from dropping. Um, so it's, it's a little bit finicky, but it's attributes, good attributes are that it colors up beautifully, great color break, and it, it, the internal quality is excellent and the size is good too. And it can be produced as early as late September, early October. So, so maybe horticulturally, we can overcome some of those problems still. So uh, I, I wouldn't give up on early pride just yet. It's totally seedless, if I didn't mention before. Then there's, there's other grapefruit varieties. I mentioned flame also, and then there's the hybrids. Uh, this is one that UF has released, UF914. It's a seedless sweet, uh, quotation mark grapefruit. It's a grapefruit-like variety. Uh, to me, it tastes more like a pamela, which it's a hybrid of pamela and uh, grapefruit. Uh, so therefore it lacks uh, the intense acidity that most grapefruit will have. Um, beautiful sweet taste, beautiful color. Uh, Really, the yield is comparable to grapefruit. We measured in one year and in, in year four, we measured, actually measured it. We haven't measured it every year. It's a demonstration. Um, we got more than 800 boxes per acre, putting it right in line with the grapefruit yields. Um, early, early yielding, um, still going well now. Year seven, still going well. Um, some problems occurred with uh, oversized fruit, which was kind of juvenile fruit uh, phenomenon in the early years. Uh, maybe year, up to year three, but that's mostly taken care of now. Now this might be a little bit too much detail to swallow all in one shot, but it's basically a, a, a subjective, not an objective, it's my subjective score of how these varieties perform and various attributes, color break, etc. But let's rather just go to the right hand side and just look at the best ones and maybe the worst ones see what's wrong what could be wrong said to be wrong with them let's just focus on the good stuff so i mentioned grapefruit to me is the number one success in, in cups so all the grapefruit varieties that we've tested which isn't exhaustive but it's ray ruby ruby red and flame and we also have some duncan in there and it's not for uh, considering for commercial production but we use it for our plant uh, breeders and transformation lab they need the seeds out of Duncan grapefruit, but they perform beautifully horticulturally. Uh, prolific production, early production. So I'm, I'm confident that most grapefruit varieties will be very successful in cups. So that's a five star. And we get four, I'd, I'd give four stars to Honey Mercot and W Mercot, and maybe even five for W Mercot. We think we've figured out the problem with color break now. Uh, and some three stars for Dancy. It's got seeds, otherwise a great variety. It also apparently doesn't pack that well. It, it's, it's a softer peel, um, which I understand. I've seen it now. Uh, Sugar Bell, also three star, I think. It's got a few attributes that still need fine tuning. The alternate bearing I mentioned. Um, it's seedless. Though. It's beautifully seedless in the cups. Normally seedy with cross-pollination outdoors, but it's seedless in the cups. Um, high quality fruit. Uh, and look at the seasons here. If you want early varieties, uh, certainly grapefruit tend to cover most of the spectrum from, from relatively early. That really should be October to January there. Um, it's, grapefruit just hang on the tree for so long. So, so it's like another good choice if you want to cover a spectrum of the season. Um, honey Mercot is late. Uh, w Mercot is mid, December to January. That's my uh, interpretation based on what I've seen. Dancy again is kind of mid season. So if you want the early varieties, you're going to have to go something like Early Pride or Bingo, uh, BB4, which is ex not released yet, I don't believe. And, and of course, UF914 being grapefruit-like does, again, does the whole spectrum. It, it hangs on forever. You can sell it anytime you like, pretty much, if you manipulate things. Um, so I think I, there were some failures. Not many, though. Clementine is a complete failure. It just doesn't work. Not here in Florida and Cups. I mean, maybe we haven't tried something. We might be missing something. The trees grow beautifully, nothing wrong with the trees, healthy, vigorous. Um, they set fruit, they bloom like crazy, but we haven't had any, we've had like two or three fruits 
over six years. And so really nothing to comment on that, except I would, you'd be taking a very high risk if you tried, I think. Temple might have some potential. I'll give it two star. Um, it, it's not my favorite tasting fruit, but it, it was pretty good production. And um, it has some seeds also. So I think, I think that covers most of the scenarios there. I need to move on. Um, then, you know, we have a lot of varieties here. So not detailed assessments of these, but just worth mentioning, especially some of the failures, like the navels just didn't do well. Again, um, you cannot completely discount it as an as a absolute failure based on our single assessment here, because, because we, the main reason being that all our varieties are pretty much tied into the same watering and fertilization regime. And so it's not optimized for individual varieties. So I think if, if one had to try this again, and if we had the money and the space, we could try to optimize things for navel, only for navel in its own house and, and get the nutrition and the, and the irrigation and everything right. And, and it may work, but with our system it didn't work. Even the juice varieties don't do that great. Although honestly, I think I, could, I would add another star to both of them, Hamlin and Valencia, given that we now have solved this color break problem through nutrition. Uh, and even the granulation, it seems to have disappeared. Not surprisingly though, because uh, excess fertilization has been, I think, tied in many cases to, to granulation also, or, or granulation type fertilization, shall I say. Satsuma, it's really a cold variety, cold season, a cold climate variety, so not surprising. I'll give it a one star. Uh, Tangelo, low yields, uh, page, page Tangelo, and then blood orange, it's too hot here. It needs colder temperatures to get that nice red color. So, so some things we tried, you can see here, the, the, the ones that stand out as being excellent, Persian lime does very well, and so does so do the lemons, especially the Maya lemon did really well. Okay. So let's move on to uh, near the end here, which is good. Um, we're looking at, um, in, this, in this picture, the incomplete color break that was very common with uh, W. Mercot and other varieties, but particularly troublesome with W. Mercot because internal quality was excellent. Nothing wrong with it, um, but it failed to color up, which makes it uh, a very uh, a lower grade on, in terms of marketability. So we, we thought of various things that could be to blame. The first one we thought of was, well, it's so hot in Florida, typically in the fall, October, November, it can still be very hot, um, especially October. In, in November, it's kind of, some, some, some years can be cooler, some, some not. So, didn't come up with any real clues there. We also thought, well, is it just this variety? But no, other varieties were struggling too, uh, even, even sugar bell uh, in some years. So. so we looked at what could be the cause, came across this very easily seen observation where uh, localized shading can cause uh, early, very early uh, color break under the leaves. You can even see the shapes of the leaves there. So we thought logically that some kind of shading would be beneficial there you can see it so the question was you know, can artificial shading uh, be used as an alternative so we looked at different colors or photoselective uh, shade cloths and bags uh, ran a replicated experiment uh, we've now run a second season of it which we we want to present at the fshs so i'm only showing you the previous the first season which was actually done on uh, uf914 i think the, the photo here shows grapefruit the, but the results I will show are on UF914 variety. Um, yeah, that's UF914 fruit. You can see this was coming out of a green bag, was very successful in transforming or inducing early color break on those areas where the, uh, uh, the screen mesh were covering the fruit. You can see that there. So you can see this big netting pattern on the fruit, proving that, in fact, where the unfiltered light came through the holes in the screen, it was still green, the peel was still green. So very interesting effect. The net effect, we just simply measured by, with photography and digital image processing. And so we got an average um, of the whole fruit. And here are the results, it was highly significant with analysis of variance. The colors we tested were control, which was uncovered ba uh, with bags, just a bare fruit with no bag. Then a black colored bag, a red, a green, and a blue. And uh, as I showed you there, the green did the best by far. And uh, what I'm measuring here is the CCI or citrus color index, which is based on the, um, um, the CIE LAB. Um, LAB is the lightness, A is the redness, and B is the uh, yellowness of fruit. 
and what this this index does is it, it's a combined index of the yellowness and the redness. Okay, so so that's a pretty good index or measurement to use for, for peel color. And the higher the number, the better. So you can see there, all of them did, all the bags did better than the control. Uh, and all the colors did better than the black, you know, the, the, the one that blocks all the light. So, and green did by far the, the best. So uh, we, as I said, we've had uh, another year of results. They're a little less consistent. We are trying to figure out if it's due to the variety. They don't match up exactly with these results. Um, so we, we, we finishing off the analysis and we'll be presenting that soon. Uh, and then um, the next aspect that we thought uh, uh, worth investigating and did so was to look at the effect of uh, nutrients on color break and internal quality. Because uh, there is some literature out there already that, that shows uh, the effects, harmful effects of too much nutrition. Um, including this one, fruit regreening after late applications of nitrogen. They've been recorded forever. You know, it's in the literature, including in our own Nutrition of Florida Citrus Trees manual. You'll find it in there. Um, now, whole chapters haven't been written about it or anything. So it needed some more reworking, which we did. We ran some experiments. And it also appeared to us that logically the damage occurs in the maturation phase when nutrient levels are too high. So that's, uh, you know, post summer going into the fall. And normal low leaf nitrogen and phosphorus in the fall may be related to reduced uptake at lower soil temperatures. We came up with this idea. Well, we thought, well, what's the mechanism? And normally people just by observation relate color break to low temperatures in the fall. Especially when a cold front comes through, you can actually notice it. It's real, it's a real effect. But we thought, well, especially being soil to scientists, well, what if it's because of reduced uptake of nutrients? And so we I dug into the literature and sure enough, Nitrogen especially is, it becomes very unavailable uh, to the roots at temperatures in the 50s. So once it drops to the 50s, that's soil temperatures. Uh, also root growth slows down tremendously. And finally also the uh, water conductivity. And I think uh, Jim Syverson published some of that uh, years ago. Uh, water conductivity is greatly inhibited at lower temperatures. So, so all those lead to the net result of less nutrients reaching the canopy of the tree. And so nitrogen and phosphorus. So, so in fact, I'm pretty convinced that low temperatures in the fall um, don't have, they may have some direct effect on, on maturation and color break, but there's also these, you could call them indirect effects because of starvation of certain nutrients. So we set out to test that out artificially. So can we in fact compensate for warmer fall temperatures with smart fertilizer timing and improved color break and quality? That's what we set out to do. So um, this is the one set of results, but before we ex I explain that, um, these were, the experiment consisted of identifying 20 trees in our cups of honey mercot variety that showed uh, different degrees of color break. Uh, and the reason that happened in the first place is because we use drip irrigation. And over years, even just after one year, there's a lot of variability in the uh, outputs of those drippers. So we knew that different trees down the row were getting different amounts of fertilizer and water. And, and sure enough, we noticed, uh, we, we, we subsequently related that to the nutrition uh, as measured in leaf concentrations of nitrogen and other nutrients relating to the uh, amount of color development. And, and you can see a very strong negative, highly significant negative relationship between what I'll explain what this is. This is the CIE A star, which is the amount of greenness to redness. So on the lower axis going into negatives, it's more green. And that's how this, act, this, this number reads. And on the higher numbers, it's more red colors. Um, so therefore you wanna be in this region. And as you can see, I've shown all the points. It was 20 trees. There's the 20 points plotted. But to make it more interesting, I also showed you the, uh, I've superimposed the actual fruit images that we used to, to measure the color, but not all of them. I, obviously that graph would be too cluttered. I've shown just a selection of them to show you the range. So you can see, at these higher leaf nitrogen concentrations, a failure to color up at the lower, even down into the deficient range here, you get a very good coloring up. So in fact, uh, it's roughly from the low end of optimal nitrogen down to the low end. And even into, if you want to, you can even go into the deficient range and you should get much better uh, color break at those ranges. Now that's for the red component of the color measurement. 
And then you, as I mentioned, there's also the B star, which is the yellow component. Again, it's important for, for measuring color of fruit, both the red and the yellow component. Similar relationship was found with leaf nitrogen and showing the fruit again. And again, same conclusion about where we should be aiming for at that time of the year at, in the fall season. And then furthermore, this was really interesting. And we, I'm going to present this at the FSHS, the, the State Horticulture Society meeting coming up this month. Uh, similar responses were measured for leaf phosphorus. Really interesting. Um, and, and also uh, sulfur and mag uh, magnesium. Magnesium was a positive response. So the more magnesium in the leaf, the better the color. So it was the opposite relationship. So I, I'm not showing all of it here today. There's no time. Um, I'm just mentioning some of the things. But really exciting was also that total soluble solids were also related in the same, with the same relationship. The more nitrogen and phosphorus in the, in the leaf, the lower the bricks was. Okay, so a negative relationship. Um, I, I'm sorry. Uh, let me make sure it's crystal clear. I said, uh, I think I said lower nutrients of nitrogen and phosphorus, uh, meaning lower bricks. It's, sorry, it's, it's the same relationship as this, meaning it's inverse. The uh, lower the nutrition is, the higher the bricks was, which is good. So, so think of it, higher bricks, better color. You get both at the same time. Uh, all I'm doing is changing the, the nutrition of the trees at that time of the year, the fall maturation phase. So then we went ahead last year. I was convinced this was really going to prove dividends. And I just we just uh, stopped all nitrogen fertilization in our cups on uh, at the equinox, 22nd of September. And we'll probably do the same again this year. That's my plan because it worked so well. It was just to demonstrate that this would work. Uh, remaining daily fertigation was reduced to also 25% of the maximum to allow depletion of leaf nutrients in the fall to low, to, into the low or lower range of optimal. And results were superb. Uh, every single variety improved in both external color break as well as internal quality, uh, the, the, especially the amount of total soluble solids and bricks. Um, so it resulted in uh, early color break. Um, and at the same time, Visible symptoms of nitrogen, not surprisingly, developed. I'll show you those, but that was okay. Everything recovered perfectly again. You, you've seen photos of the trees. It, it's, it's a temporary deficiency, which is a helpful deficiency. It helps get the right fruit quality, and you can easily overcome it then in the spring by starting to feed again and prime the trees and get into bloom and, and the next production. So by far, this was the most successful intervention for improving color break and quality and cups fresh fruit. It's easy to do. Uh, here's some photos of the results. So this was honey mercot. Normally, we in previous years, we had problems getting honey mercot to color up uh, even in January. One year, we had to harvest them in February, which is crazy because they just weren't colored up and the internal quality wasn't right. So we, we, had, we had already in early December a honey mercot coloring up. And typically, that's a late season, mid to late season variety. Um, and, uh, but notice also, as I point out here, the pale green leaves showing low nitrogen status. So this was taken just before Christmas. Uh, I can't read that title, so I think that's what it says. And uh, this is grapefruit in 6th of January, uh, showing just the leaves with the yellow veins and the pale green, which is classic nitrogen deficiency. We also sampled them and measured them to confirm that they were very low. But it's post-harvest, so it doesn't matter. You know, they, we harvested the fruit in about the first, second week of December just a month before. And um, they were already showing signs of nitrogen deficiency there. And so you know, the tree suffers from nitrogen deficiency for maybe a couple of months, right in the winter, which really doesn't matter. And then starting as early as February, we then start priming the trees again with more nutrients for the next cycle. And they, they, they respond immediately. There's no, no looking back. So, so we, we think for cups at least, we've got a, a really good solution. Um, Let's look at the science behind it and why this works. I'd like to relate it to the uh, development stages of the fruit. So I, I just numbered it from zero, one, two, and three. So it's four phases. Some people might say there's only three phases, but I call zero as bloom and fruit set. Easy to remember. Um, so that's the initiation. And then uh, cell division is the after the fruit sets, there's the first phase. It, it's fairly short. It runs until physiological fruit drop, which is about May for most of Florida. Then it goes into the cell enlargement stage, which is another phase of uh, uh, fruit development where cell division stops and the sizes of the cells increase. And then you get the maturation phase, which is a fairly long phase. And that's where you should be careful with too much fertilization. 
So you need a lot of, you need most of your fertilizer over here. And I'll explain why. So it's basically an S-shaped curve. It's a sinusoidal shaped curve. You have your pre-bloom priming fertilizer here, especially if you've been inhibiting and holding back on fertilizer for the previous fruit crop, as I mentioned. It means it's necessary to prime them prior to blooming, but it's not much. Here's your S-shaped curve. You notice it's really not much. It's maybe 10%. This is cumulative. The axis here reads cumulative nitrogen fertilizer in percent. So going up to 100% at the end of the season, you need very little just to prime them as early as February. Come March, it's in bloom. Then it really needs to take off. You notice the steep curve here, the sinusoidal curve. Um, according to some of the other literature I've found for fresh fruit production overseas, you should be at 50% nitrogen feeding uh, just after bloom, which is according to this S-shaped curve is perfect. That's where it is, there's 50%. Then you should be at 75% at the end of cell division and physiological fruit drop. So end of May, you should already have applied 75% of your nitrogen. And then you should be at close to 100% by uh, end of cell enlargement. Well, at least you should have your last application applied then, close somewhere in that region. So that it then diminishes down to very little during the maturation phase. So you get this drawdown of nutrients here, which is beneficial. For, for, for fruit quality production um, and color break. And, and, and uh, for reference, I put in a linear curve here because you know there's a lot of talk about constant fertilization, but that mainly relates to outdoors, you know, the needs for feeding HLB positive trees. We're also looking at that, uh, by the way, at the same time, but I want to focus on cups here. But if you, if, you, if you were to do a linear fertilization, that's what it would look like. It would be a constant supply, uh, equal increments, throughout the year. And it might be four increments. You might be putting one down there and another one there and another one there and so on. I'm not saying every day. This happens to be a weekly uh, axis uh, type of scale here. So in other words, um, it shows day of year there, but I'd be assuming I'd be doing fertigation and putting on every week. Um, but look at the next graph. What I do is I take this curve, both curves, and I take the first derivative of it. First derivative takes the slope of the curve. So I'm going to compare for every day of the year here, the slopes of these two curves. This is what I get, first derivative. Uh, and what it, it pictorially shows you is the way, where you should avoid excesses and deficiencies, as the title says there, because both can harm fruit quality if they occur at the wrong time. You want to have excess, not excesses, but you want to have super high, if, uh, sufficient optimal levels in the spring. See the big peak there? So this is now a derivative. So this is the units are nitrogen fertilizer as percent per week. That's what a slope is, per week. So you have, this is where your maximum input of fertilization should be, and especially nitrogen, because that's all the protein building going on there uh, through the bloom, fruit set, and cell division phases. And then you go into your cell enlargement stage where you can afford to have less. You want to start getting, uh, diminishing the, the supply. And then you get down here into maturation, like I said, and the, the inputs per week are very small see that diminishing down to zero. Now compare it with the linear. If I take the slope of a linear straight line, like the one shown here, that straight line, the slope is constant, right? So it's just a constant. It's, it's X amount per week or percent per week. It's nearly 2% per week. That, that's the slope of the straight line. Where they intersect, you can see if, if you were to use linear fertilization rather than sigmoidal fertilization, you would get a tremendous deficit during the spring there. You're not keeping up, so your supply and demand matching is poor. You're not matching supply with demand. Your tree's demanding the, the, the S-shape, the, the sinusoidal curve, and you are inputting only a linear response, which so it means you're gonna run out. And, and I've seen that happen this year. I've seen it happen every year. It happened to us in the cups too. And it, it, the last two or three years, we've learned to avoid that. So beware of that. It's a real, it's a real bump. It's a real bump in the in the, uh, in the shape of, nuts, of nutrient demand for, for citrus trees. And then in the fall, sure enough, if you were to apply fertilizer linearly, you would be putting on too much here during the maturation because it only needs that much down there on the, on the uh, sigmoidal curve. So that's, that shows, I think, very clearly the periods of deficiency and periods of excess. And so recommendations I've come up with so far, apply most of the phosphorus fertilizer in pre-bloom to post-bloom period only. Don't apply, it, don't apply it later in the year. Number one, phosphorus is very available in Florida soils. Number two, it's very persistent. 
unlike the other nutrients, K and N. It, it doesn't leach easily, it doesn't move easily. It's going to still be around and you want to deplete it somewhat in the fall so that you can get proper food coloring and maturation. Uh, and also don't apply any phosphorus in the given year if leaf and soil levels are high. Now that applies to bearing trees. For, for young non-bearing trees, things are different. So bear in mind, I'm talking about fruit bearing trees. Apply 50% of nitrogen by the post bloom period. I've already mentioned that in the graph when we looked at it. Apply 75% of nitrogen by the physiological fruit drop, May or June. And then the remainder going up to 100%, you should be finishing off by end of summer, depending on the maturity date of the variety. So I said mid to end of summer. So for early varieties it would be mid and for the late, uh, late season, later season varieties, it would be at the end of summer. You should stop your nitrogen fertilization. Um, most importantly, you can monitor all of this. You don't have to be guessing. Uh, look for leaf, nitrogen, and phosphorus concentrations and aim for the high end of optimal levels in the spring to early summer and uh, low optimal or low leaf, ni leaf nitrogen phosphorus levels in the late summer and fall. And uh, so that's, that can be your, your dipstick, your benchmark that you can be measuring and making sure you're on track. Um, so acknowledgement, parts of these these recommendations here were adapted from an Australian document, Fruit Size Management Guide, part one. There's the, the uh, link to that. All right, so um, some other problems which we've observed in the cups. These are the last few slides. I won't keep you much longer. Uh, we have cosmetic damage to fruit peel caused by many things, uh, especially greasy spot, melanose, and scab diseases. We're working on some some, some better remedies for those as well as part of our funded projects here in the cups. And other cause of blemishes, the main ones we've seen are from rust mites and thrips. So, so we, again, we just have to be on top of controlling those pests and diseases. Then as you can see in this photo, we used to have a lot of fruit splitting and pre-harvest drop, but honestly, in the last two years, since we've been doing better fertilization based on the outcomes of what I've just shown you, uh, doing a better uh, supply demand nutrient matching, we have seen a great decline in, in, in splitting. So this, what I'm showing you in the photo is the worst year, which is uh, two seasons back. Um, so hopefully we've got that under control now. So, but what was happening is the fruit was splitting on the tree. And then of course it cannot stay on the tree and it falls off. So in summary, I think uh, CUPS has been quite successful for seven years here. Um, sorry, that should be six years, but six years of harvests. Uh, despite being adjacent to HLB positive and ACP infested trees, as you can see here, they're, they're, they're right next to the uh, fully HLB positive trees. The growth rate of trees and cups is about twice the rate of healthy trees outside and trees with HLB certainly cannot compete with that. Uh, commercially, a lot of growers have tried this also uh, on, a, on, a, on a really serious level. Here's a 10 acre cups. Uh, there's about 500 acres or more than 500 by now. But I wanted to show you the growth rate. This is at year one in a 10 acre cups, that's W Mercot. And then uh, just a couple of years, one and a half years later, here's the production of W Mercot and the trees were fully grown. So with that, I'll finish off and uh, I'd like to acknowledge various growers, stakeholders and cooperators that, that, that really made this possible. Uh, extension agents, laboratory and support staff here at the CREC, the funding from various sources, and um, with that, if there's any interesting questions, I'd be happy to take them. Thank you, Dr. Schumann. Thank you for a very informative presentation. I am going to check the chat box, see if we have questions. If you are interested about CEUs, send an email to Jean McAvoy and provide the information in the chat box. One comment, I am interested in what you are doing to get better color break with W Merkak. Oh, uh, yes, after, I'm just reading it myself now. Yes, that's uh, the reason we did the experiment on the honey mercots is because we didn't have enough W mercot trees in our cups to, to do that experiment with. Um, but uh, we, after having starved, let's call it starved the trees last year from September 
um, we saw the same result with W. Mercot. Uh, but we just don't have the scientific data to, to show the results. But they, they were fully colored up by uh, early December at the very latest. Yeah. So I, I think it, it worked on all the varieties. Every single variety we have here had an improved color break, including the grapefruits. Second one, which temple was used? Standard temple or something else? Uh, which one is that, Mongi? Uh, which temple variety? Oh, you I see it, yeah, yeah. Standard temple. I'm pretty sure we just got it from not a, you know, it was, it's a demonstration, only five trees, uh, sorry, 10 trees. So we got whatever was available. I, I didn't ask for anything other than standard temple. Another question, have you tried EV1? Uh, okay, where's that? Uh, have, have you tried, tried EV1, Valencia? Uh, sorry, I'm blind. I don't see You tried that. Valencia and Hamlin, but how about EV1? Uh, okay, sorry. Paul, hang on with me. I'm searching. Extra, really? Okay, that's bottom line. EV1, where's the question? I'd like to just read it. Just, just, just read it to me again. I can't see it. it. Have we tried what? Have you tried EV1 Valencia? Uh, no, no. We, our, our Valencias, I'm pretty certain, are standard Valencias also. Yeah. The presentation is being recorded, so the recording will be available probably next week at the IFA Center website. Right. And we will send you an email as well. Yeah, if there's any follow-up, um, Dr. Schumann, are please you let applying, me know. Dr. Schumann, are you applying more potassium on mercats in the fall to prevent the fruit splits? Yes. We also apply a lot of potassium in the fall because we uh, get uh, Mercot tree collapse or tangerine tree collapse, um, if we don't. Uh, one of the nutrients that we most strongly correlated with tree collapse, which means from over, over, yield, over yielding, overburdened trees, is potassium. You get, you get incredible potassium deficiencies if you, uh, which coincide with tree collapse. And we, we have been able to, to ward that off by applying more potassium. But you need to do it early on. You, well, once you see tree collapse occurring, you cannot rectify it with potassium fertilization. So you've got to be proactive and fertilize your trees. So, so our potassium does kind of the opposite of what the nitrogen does. We, we put on a low amount of potassium in the spring, uh, at least uh, pre-bloom, and then um, quite a lot during the cell division stage going into physiological fruit drop. And then we, we sustain that though. We don't, we don't really drop off much in potassium fertilization. Um, we, we still emphasize potassium fertilization going into the fall, but the, the amount per, per week is reduced because a tree is a tree goes into a kind of a semi-senescent stage in the in the fall. They need very low amounts of everything at that stage. The, the, the development of fruit is done. It's just going into maturation. Um, but but yes, potassium is the last nutrient we want to terminate because it's important to prevent collapse. Another question, can kaolin clay provide enough shade to further help color? I don't know. I have never tried that. It, 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 well, it, it might. If I had to hazard a guess, I would say it, it might, yeah. But long time ago, we were thinking that shade reduce color. Um, was that result of experiments? I, I, I'm not sure. Right. That, that, that's why they do some pruning. They do some pruning really to get the sunlight. And then when you get the sunlight, you get a better color. Yeah, um, that might be related to the, I won't remember the names. I'm not that clued up on the, uh, the chemical names of the different pigments, but, but that might be uh, whether it's xanthophyll or, uh, Carotene may have different requirements. You know, the more orangey colors versus, or the, the red on a grapefruit, the redder blush colors. 
I suspect respond differently from the the matrix orange yellow color that a, that a grapefruit gets and different requirements with shading. So, so shading, that's why I don't have much interest in shading now that I know what to do with nutrition. That's what I was saying. It's by far the better solution to the problem. I don't think I'm going to pursue the shading option in great, you know, spend a lot of effort on it because we, we've got the solution with nutrition. Um, so to answer the question though, yeah, I, I think different, maybe varieties of different requirements for shading, if that's the way you want to do it. And also, like I said, different pigments may have different requirements or different responses. Xanthophyll may respond differently from carotene, for example. Either more shade or less shade. It's complicated. Thank you, Dr. Schumann. Julie, do you have any information for the group? Most likely not. So thank you, Jean and Julie, for your help. Thank you all for your participation. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.